Brian's done a number of important articles for International Socialist Review, Socialist Worker, um, and a number of lectures um, on uh, really recovering like the radical history of Martin Luther King Jr.'s last struggle in those last, on the last years of his life, which has really brought to a new generation um, that, that story, which has been so suppressed and hidden. Um, so, you know, in addition to all those achievements, Brian's also an activist in the day-to-day -day struggle um, of, of the working class um, and a teacher in Harlem's public schools. So this is someone with a lot to say um, and an excellent speaker, but I'll let you uh, be convinced of that by him. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Brian. Wow. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, it's nice to be back in uh, Rhode Island after I haven't been here in 10 years. Um, but I, as soon as I got off the bus, a man with no shoes in Kennedy Plaza was asking me for money. And I was reminded that uh, I wasn't on vacation. Um, that the economic crisis that is ripping through where I live in New York City is ripping through everywhere and is absolutely devastating people's lives. And that's a big reason why we're having this meeting or why the title that Marx is back. Um, increasingly, I'm sure you've seen, the, uh, the S word is even back. Not only Marx, but yes, the socialism is uh, a word that is bandied about by the left and by uh, right-wing talk radio. You may have heard. You may have seen this Newsweek cover of a little while ago. We are all socialists now. You can go home. Um, there's an interesting, um, and from their perspective, I suppose a hopeful article, a uh, long article in here about why there won't be a revolution. Um, the cover title is about all the, you know, the kind of takeover, nationalization, increasing role of the state. Um, and it says, you know, Americans may get angry at them sometimes, but we don't hate the rich. We prefer to laugh at them. Hmm. Um, and then there's a picture of Donald Trump in what appears to be a gold uh, gilded room. Um, and it wasn't long after this article came out that people were taking, uh, there was a popular bus tour to the AIG executives' homes uh, to throw things at them and, and yell at their gates, if not try to get through. Um, and I think there was even a more telling cartoon actually within this, uh, within this issue. Um, it's a picture of Osama, what appears to be Osama bin Laden and an associate. And uh, the Osama bin Laden character says, I brought chaos and destruction to New York's financial district. And his associate says, I hear you can get a bonus for that. <laughs> and I think that begins to speak to what's really going on, which is an enormous an eruption of class anger. And the, real, the real reason for the return of Marx is the return of class and the return of class anger in this country. And instead of just the kind of admiring or, or foaming over, fawning over the rich in this country, there's a sense that maybe they're the ones who've done this to us. Maybe oh, it's not Osama bin Laden, who, that's what's so brilliant about that comic, Osama bin Laden, who we've been taught to fear, taught that he's the main problem, that actually is there something, these bankers, these people who've been getting rich off of us. And uh, The Economist picked up, uh, I think, this mood even more with a picture which seems to appear from one of the bourgeois revolutions, perhaps the French or American Revolution, but the woman in front with no shoes and, you know, her clothes are falling off, clearly a proletarian is carrying a banner that says, get the rich, and everybody's picking up muskets. And inside the article talks about how people in France are, you know, there was protesters, huge protests at the G20 meeting in Europe, that people in France are kidnapping their bosses. Um, have you heard about this? The boss napping. Um, they call it and they say that there's a new mood that's arrived. That's absolutely right. In fact, I think Socialist Worker, which tends to be a very angry newspaper, if you read it, you know, it, it, okay, maybe that was an understatement, you know. Yeah, it's an angry newspaper. Um, and it kind of prides itself on that. I think Socialist Worker was outdone that week, the week of the kind of AIG, um, when the, you know, the, the fire at AIG kind of reached a boiling point. Our headline was um, AI Greed, okay. That's angry. Okay. That was good. But uh, AM New York, which is a free newspaper just kind of given out, and usually it's like silly stuff is on the cover. They had the same week they had this cover, Need for Greed, with a fat cat and you don't see him with his stogie, and he's, he's lighting his stogie with a $100 bill. I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> socialist worker or AM New York, which one was the angrier newspaper? 
Republicans, of course, are hyperventilating over the idea that, you know, that Obama is socialist or so leading us to some kind of, you know, totalitarian socialist future. But all of their hyperventilating aside, I think what really underlies all of this, the Republican uh, hysteria, the, the, the cover of AM New York, what underlies all of it is the fact that we are living through nothing short of the reversal, a profound ideological reversal of the paradigms, the ideological and economic paradigms that have dominated our entire lives. I see some folks here might be a little older than I, so let me say my entire life. I'm 35 years old. For the last 30, 40 years, there has been one paradigm that has swept all others around the world, frankly, neoliberalism. The idea that the free market needs to be let rip through everything and that will solve it. That will be the solution to healthcare. That will be the solution to education. That will be the solution to retirement. That will be the solution for everything. For banking, that everything should be organized on that model and any kind of social protections, environmental protections, labor protections are just so many fetters on the ability for society to generate creativity and wealth and prosperity for everyone. Everybody, and that entire paradigm is coming crumbling down. Its roots are the economic crisis, but we see now that it has this enormous political dimension to it. Um, and all of these questions are being raised. And, and now, importantly, the question of socialism. But I would argue the question has been raised but not answered by all of this. That is, people are thinking about it and trying to sort it through, but there's nothing in the mainstream press that you can read that gives you a straightforward sense of what the socialist tradition is really about. And so we arrive at this meeting. I want to do three things. I want to talk about, one, what Marx actually said about capitalism. Secondly, what is socialism? Well, you know, if there's, it's being thrown around a lot, what is it really? Um, and I'll start by saying something about what it is not in that section. And lastly, what do we do um, if we're for that, if we're for those things? How do we get there? So first of all, what did Marx say about economic crisis, about capitalism? Well, first of all, Marx said that uh, capitalism is the most dynamic system, most revolutionary system the world had ever seen. Capitalism had completely revolutionized life as it, it, it overturned life as it had been lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. He said the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production with them, the whole relations of society. All fixed, fast, frozen relations are swept away before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. The system's driven forward in this way. It has this relentless energy because of competition. It's like competition um, between, um, between firms, between uh, private interests, to the death, really. And that relentless competition in a historically speaking short amount of time, really a span of just a few hundred years, has produced things, um, in just an immense output of wealth. During its rule, the bourgeoisie, during its rule of scarce 100 years, he's writing in 1840-something, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than of all preceding generations together. Machinery, application of chemistry to industry, agriculture, steam navigation, railways, whole, whole, uh, clearing of whole continents for cultivation. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor. So that's all the stuff, you know, it's almost like you, you would think Marx is praising the system. But there's a flaw, there's a problem. All of that relentless energy is unplanned. And because it's unplanned, it means that it overproduces all of this stuff every 30 years or so, and there's a crisis. And he has this wonderful metaphor you might have heard about. Uh, he, he compares the bourgeoisie to a, a conjurer, if you will. Modern bourgeois society, a society has conjured up such gigantic means of production and, and, and of exchanges like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he's called up by his spells. Think about AIG and their credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations. They've conjured up all of these m amazing means of financial you know, shenanigans of, of commerce and of exchange that then are out of their own control and threaten the entire system itself. I mean, it's like Marx was describing J.P. Morgan Chase, people who had, who had these obligations in, in far greater proportion than their own actual assets. Um, you know, there was a time a long time ago when people would starve on this earth because there was not enough to eat. There would be a famine, there would be a flood, a drought, a pestilence. Something would occur that would make it difficult to produce the food and therefore people would not eat. Along comes capitalism and now there is too much food 
and that's why people starve. There's, it's not just food. Again, not too much for people to eat, but too much to sell at a profit. There's too much of everything, too many basketballs, too many TVs, too many cars. Capitalism's competitive production of pro for profit means that there's too much of everything, and therefore inevitably, inevitably, a crisis. Um, and Marx said, in these crises, there breaks out an epidemic that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity. The epidemic of overproduction. Society finds itself put back into a state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed, and why? Because there's too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. And to what do we owe the honor of our current uh, economic malaise? Too many houses, too many subprime mortgages. Uh, not too many to house the people, not too many for the person who uh, met me when I got off the bus in Kennedy or to the many other people who seemed completely destitute um, in New York City or Kennedy Plaza or wherever you might go around the state of Rhode Island, but too many houses to sell uh, for a profit. And so that's why we have to go through this universal war of devastation. Um, I think it was two million people were thrown out of work in the last four months. All of this must occur in order to destroy the, the inventory of stuff, the, the amount of capital that has been created so that the free market can repair itself. Um, I don't know the rate of unemployment. I think I read in the Projo, um, haven't said the phrase Projo in about 10 years. Um, I think I read in the Projo is 9%, but I'm sure it's, you know, what's that? 10.6, but that's just the official employment rate. I'm sure people here can talk about layoffs and all the things uh, that are facing the states right now. But all of these people must lose their jobs. Factories must close. Uh, people must leave their homes, and the homes then sit empty. All of that must occur for this market uh, mechanism to, to right itself. And I'm sure everyone here has heard about it and how in California there's people living in tents in huge parks of people living in tents who then wake up and go to work um, every morning when they get out of their tent. Um, absolute madness. So if that's capitalism, what is socialism? What's the solution to that? Well, for most of the 20th century, and therefore for most of the last 100 years, the main examples that people have had of something calling itself socialist have been one of two things. On the one hand, either some form of Stalinism, like uh, Castro's Cuba, Mao's China, Stalin's Russia, or some form of social democracy, what's known as social democracy. That is kind of parliamentary socialism, like vote for me, the socialist candidate, um, to get into office, like they might have in France or in other European countries, where you'd have large socialist parties that get a lot of the vote or occasionally actually hold um, some office, maybe even hold the, uh, the highest office of the state. Um, there's an American socialist by the name of Hal Draper, uh, who's now dead, but um, wrote back in the 60s um, that he, re he argued that mainly there's two strains of socialism, two souls uh, was the title of his pamphlet, um, and that, th that Stalinism and social democracy were both actually variants of the same soul, if you will, that is the soul of socialism from above, of somebody else bringing you socialism, some either heroic guerrilla leader or some Stalinist bureaucrat or some um, parliamentary official doing it on your behalf, and that there was another soul, the soul that actually is the soul of Marx's, um, although Marx didn't believe in the soul, um, <laughs> the soul of Marx's Marxism, if you will, the soul of socialism from below. Um, and Marx and Engels were very clear that, that, that they were not, uh, you know, they were not just statists. They were not just for some kind of socialist, you know, government that was just like a, you know, they said, you know, we're not among those communists who are out to destroy personal liberty who wish to turn the world into one huge barrack. This is Engels. Or into a gigantic workhouse. And this is Engels, of course, speaking directly to Joseph Stalin. We're, we're not the ones who want to trade liberty for freedom, in other words. Um, he says, we have no, no desire to exchange freedom for equality. Sorry. We are convinced that in no social order will personal freedom be so assured as in a society based on communal ownership. Um, that's a whole different soul of socialism, if you will. They, um, uh, they, they ridiculed, uh, they wrote an, a pamphlet called uh, The Poverty of Philosophy, in which, in, in part, they ridiculed the idea that simply owning state ownership itself would equal socialism. And Engels joked that, uh, you know, the Aust Austrian 
uh, Chancellor Metternich or, or Napoleon would be among the founders of socialism because they nationalized the tobacco industry. I mean, you know, it's not just because I'm, I, I'm a teacher. I work for the state. Um, that doesn't mean we have workers' power. With, I wish uh, within education. I, you know, ask a postal worker if they feel like, oh, no, I work, you know, no, I don't work for a private. And, no, you know, you, 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 you feel, even if, you, even if the state controls uh, the workplace or controls an industry, doesn't mean it's therefore automatically uh, socialistic, um, but it does mean, it, it means, well, I'll say what it means in a minute. It does not mean um, that it's socialism because you still are operating under, in a market system and you still are operating under the same pressures um, to do things for a bottom line and to do things as cheaply as possible. They put the same pressure on you as an employee. Um, there's much more to say about that. I won't give you the long quote on Engels arguing, but essentially the same thing over and over. There's countless examples of the state intervention which is the way it's popularly bandied about right now, does not equal socialism, according to Marx uh, and Engels. And I think when you look at what uh, even Bush and Obama, actually, what started under the very end of Bush's term and now has continued under Obama, their interventions, the state's intervention, reaching in and seizing AIG and effectively nationalizing it, but not not nationalizing it, but in some ways they have gone in and seriously intervened in places where previously they were the, pri the, the domain of the private you know, entrepreneurs or the, or the CEOs running a certain enterprise. We can see what is the purpose of that state intervention. It's not, the purpose of it is not to take it over and make it the people's AIG, you know, the people's insurance company. No, the purpose is to shore it up, is to get it back on its feet and to preserve it, to preserve it in its original form. And even, I think that's why people have been so angry about these bailouts, is it seems that they're using enormous sums of our money to go in and rescue these people uh, who made these horrible bets. That is why the spirit of the bailouts, the spirit of the, you know, the cash for trash uh, TARP plan is about, really is about socializing their losses and privatizing any gain that can come from it. Um, it's not the kind of nationalization uh, that we, I think, are calling for. But socialists do call for nationalization. So I just want to say something about that for a second because it's not that we're opposed to all national. I don't want you to flip over the other way. Actually, socialists often argue for nationalization. For example, our healthcare system is badly in need of nationalization. I would argue our banking system is badly in need of nationalization. There's several reasons why we are for nationalization, even if we say, even if we would argue that nationalization doesn't automatically then equal socialism. For the one hand, the thing that I think is part of what's made some of these CEOs and, and Republican, their, you know, their kind of Republican buddies so upset is that all of the th decisions they used to take behind closed doors in private are now publicly discussed. We, the people on the street, are reading in the newspapers and debating. We know who these people are. Their faces are on the front page of the papers in every transaction. Oh, should these people get a bonus? Of course they should get a bonus. Wait a minute. The public is noticing that that's outrageous that they're getting a bonus. They used to get those bonuses all the time. But now we notice that they got a bonus. We followed it very closely and it's become a public discussion. That's part of what nationalization does. It takes things out of the private realm of unaccountable, unelected CEOs, boards of trustees, etc., and makes it part of the public discussion. And even if we know our, our democracy isn't a very highly accountable system, it gives us some pretext, a greater uh, pretext under which to try to hold them accountable. And the, whole, and the whole idea of the thing, which is really the second point for nationalization, is the whole ideology of it. It is an attack on for, for, for our side that is against the idea that the free market ought to be running everything. I think the idea of having a, you know, public libraries, not libraries for profit, is itself an idea that we would want to promote. The idea, yes, people should, the idea ought to be able to get books into people's hands, not to make a buck. That ought to be the idea behind a library. We would say the same thing about healthcare. The idea ought to be to provide health uh, for people, not to make a buck by denying them um, healthcare. And, you know, of course, in many countries, nationalization is a way to protect your resources from countries like the United States that are uh, eager to steal them. So what is socialism then? If it's not just nationalization or state control, although socialism would, of course, involve, I, uh, would involve a, a great nationalization or a great taking over by the state, but the question is, who controls the state? If the state has control of everything, then whose state is it? In, and in what way, really? And the whole idea behind socialism, I think you could sum up in the phrase workers' power. It's the idea that we would control the state, that it would be ours. Um, where Marx, and this is really the most radical element of Marx, um, 
if you don't mind a, a quick digression, I just want to tell you the other night, um, maybe you've seen this movie, um, X-Men 3. I was watching this movie. It relates. It relates. <laughs> Sean's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they brought this guy here, and he's talking about X-Men 3. I, like, I really love like, you know, superhero movies. I, I just adore these movies. Um, but I was watching X-Men 3, and I was thinking about the whole nature of the genre and the whole idea of superheroes. And, you know, it's like in this one, at least for part of the time, Magneto, you don't have to know the movies. He's like the bad guy, and he has amazing powers. You know, he can do all kinds of things. And I was thinking, like, you know, could ordinary people rise up against, in their great numbers, could they rise up against Magneto? No, they, they could not. Because he just is so powerful. He has so much power concentrated in his, his hands. What you really need to stop Magneto is a band of equally powerful superhumans. Another, you know, on the other side, you need like the good guys. Either a few unique individuals who are heroic and have the abilities or whatever, or like a band, a small band of them to oppose Magneto. And I was thinking about this because I really think it's not just comic books and movies, but it's a, it's a common conception in political life in America that really what we need is some kind of a unique hero, a charismatic leader, uh, someone who is uniquely qualified to come and do battle with you know, the person who seems to be our enemy. It's like if there's Bush, there needs to be Obama. It's like there has to be somebody who is equal, but who's on our side, who can then as an individual do battle with this person. And what Marx was really for was a whole different conception, which I maintain, and the reason I raise this X-Men 3 silly digression is just to say that I think Marx's idea is still very radical today, still a radical idea right down to this moment. Marx's idea was that this, the emancipation of us, that our liberation, if you will, it must be, can only be the product of our own activity. That all previous historical movements, Marx argued, were movements of minorities, or numerically, or in the interest of minorities. But the proletarian movement is the self-conscious, independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. He said, communism is the... Hold on. He said it's the complete restoration of man to himself as a social, i.e. a human being. A restoration which has become conscious and which takes place within the entire, which takes the entire wealth of previous periods of development. And that therefore, it is the solution of the riddle of history and knows itself to be the solution. It, 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 you understand what I'm saying? It's highly conscious. It's like ordinary working class people and yet we ha must come to realize it's not like we're not just somebody's stage army, perhaps, like somebody, you know, who's a union bureaucrat or somebody just rolls us out for a nice little protest in the little protest pen and then puts us back away and really does the deal behind the doors. It's a self-conscious movement. It's a highly conscious movement. It's a movement that knows itself, knows uh, or, or must come to know what its mission in history is. And so historically, I think the the examples we would look to, which we can talk about in the discussion, the examples of the Russian Revolution in its beginnings, of the Spanish Civil War, of the Hungarian uh, movement, uh, of the Solidarność movement in Poland, of the Iranian uh, Revolution at its beginnings, the working class movement in, in Iran, of the Portuguese movement uh, in the early 70s. All of these struggles of, uh, begin it have a similar form historically, not out of an abstraction because, uh, you know, a Marxist speaker appeared before them, but just out of the nature of the struggle themselves, they took a certain form, which is working class, ordinary people trying to seize greater control of their lives through their workplace. And in the course of doing so, created their own kind of popular assemblies or organizations. They took many different names, workers, councils, uh, if you will. And that at some point, those came up against the power of the state and there had to be some kind of a confrontation. It's a very different project than simply electing into the existing state uh, some kind of socialist representatives who just kind of elevate and elevate, but an actual confrontation with the, the, our power at work, our um, unity and organization goes right up against theirs. And Marx and Engels argued that the first step would be, the, would be to, for the, ruling, the working class to win the battle of the political battle, to win the battle for political supremacy, and that from there rest by degrees, uh, I believe it's the passage from the manifesto, which I'm trying to flip to, uh, rest by degrees uh, from the ruling class what it has. That is, to be, begin to expropriate the uh, expropriators and increasingly nationalize and take over for ourselves 
um, what they have. That kind of a model of socialism in Hal Draper's phrase, socialism from below, I think is the real spirit of the Marxist project and what we in the ISO are about. Okay, sounds very good, but uh, how do we get there? What do we do? And that is the kind of, excuse me for some flipping, that is the million dollar question. And I just want to say a little bit about that and then I will um, stop talking. The first thing to say about how we get from here to there is, is, first, I think we have a lot to learn from Marx's approach. Marx was an activist. He's, you know, kind of slandered as like an academic. Man spent his entire adult life trying to build organizations, organizations of the broad working class, trade unions, and socialist, explicitly socialist organizations. Um, he and his partner, uh, Engels, were on the barricades in the bourgeois revolutions in the middle of the 19th century, and, and, and Marx again and again went to jail um, and, tried, and had to defend himself um, in, in absolutist courts um, again and again uh, for his activism. Um, Part of what I think we can learn from them is a very, they had a very kind of an undogmatic approach to uh, combining theory and practice that I think we have to apply. They said, look, you know, we don't, ha so you're, okay, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, you know, you're a socialist, you're for this socialism that I've described, then how do you then go out into the world? Here's what they said. They said, look, we do not confront the world in a doctrinaire way with a new principle. Here is the truth. Kneel down before it. We develop new principles for the world out of the world's own principles. We do not say to the world, cease your struggles, they are foolish. We will give you the true slogan of struggle. We merely show the world what it is really fighting for, explain to it the meaning of its own actions. In other words, or as they say later in the Communist Manifesto, the theoretical conclusions of the communists are in no way based on ideas or principles that have been invented or discovered by this or that would-be universal reformer. They merely express in general terms actual relations springing from an existing class struggle, from an historical movement going on under our very eyes. That is that the, in the main, in the beginning, in the, the kind of first instance, the source for all of the literature and books and ideas that we are presenting here, the source of that is the class struggle itself, is the struggle that's already going on whether we hold these meetings or not. There is a struggle between those who work for wages and those who own. And that is going on constantly. Again and again, it flashes out. I know there are examples that I'm unfamiliar with that you know because you live here. Colibri uh, group, uh, the, you know, being uh, thrown out of work um, by the, the hedge fund or what have you. You know, we could talk about it. But that is the wellspring of a, a kind of, of a radical consciousness. And hopefully as it develops, a socialist consciousness. But that is not an automatic process. That is the beginning point, I think we have to say that is the struggle, is the source of radical consciousness, and that is created by capitalism, not by socialists with their socialist ideas. It's created by the world we live in. But there is a need for an intervention by socialists to try to bring, to, to, so that the working class will know itself, and it will know itself to be the riddle of history solved. What do they suggest? Marx and Engels talk about, you know, what should socialists do? They say, look, in the national struggle of proletarians of different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interests of the entire proletariat. In various stages of development, um, blah, 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 which it has, they always and everywhere represent the interests of the movement as a whole. The communists, therefore, on the one hand, practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties, the one which pushes forward all others, theoretically, they have the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, just notice the verbs they're using. They are, they're pointing out, they're bringing to the front, they're pushing forward. That is, the socialists aren't standing outside of the struggle, commenting, wagging their finger. You know, they're not sideline, they're not on the sidelines. The idea is they're right there in the middle of the struggle, pointing out, bringing forward, pushing to the front. That is a kind of activist, interventionist organization that I think we need in this country. And you think, just imagine what's going on right now. I believe that, first of all, for years they would say to us, whenever it was time for budget cuts, you know, I'm in, I'm in a union myself. I know what it's like to go through these things. Uh, I'm in the, the United Federation of Teachers. For years they say to you, oh, you know, we don't, there's, there's no money, you know. You got to, here's the choice, you know, either uh, everybody keeps their jobs, but like, you know, you take a pay cut, or, uh, you know, we're going to have to, like, half of you have to go. You know, it's like stuff like this. You're just damned if you do, damned if you don't. These kind of, you know, choices they try to throw on us. Uh, you know, shared sacrifice and all of this. 
they just can't say that the same way. And there's no money. They can't say that the same way. I mean, the fact even that they have had to take measures to try to staunch the bleeding. Obama wants to create 3.5 million jobs. Well, shit, we lost 4 million jobs in just the last few months. That ain't enough. Obama wants to have a plan where you have health, you know, some uh, state health insurance, but you preserve the... Pr That's not good enough. We need a national health service. We can have that under capitalism. They've got it right over there in Canada. It's crazy that we don't have that. You know, the, Obama promised to stop the war. He's sending more troops to Afghanistan. On, on, on so many of these different fronts, the, question, the solution has, has practically been raised. It's right there within our reach. And I think that millions of people are getting to a point where they want to actually put up a fight around some of these things and not just let it go. That means there's an enormous opportunity for people not just to be an activist out there with the rest of activists. That's a good thing. And we need more of that. But we need a self-consciously socialist movement in this country that can be for working class power so that we can win this thing once and for all. If there's any question about is an egalitarian collective, blah, blah, yes, so we have trillions of dollars that they give away in bonuses. That's their play money on the side. We could take that money and work miracles Overnight, we could feed everybody with the bon everybody in the world with the bonuses they gave away on Wall Street this year alone. What could we do with the rest of the money? What could we do with the money from the Pentagon? What could we do with the money that they are wasting, giving it to bankers who are just gambling it? I mean, what could we do with that money if we had it in our hands? The, 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 I think the reason that Marx is back is because of the class anger. But we have to go back to the real tradition of Marx, which is about working class self-emancipation, about our own activity, about what we do. It's not easy to develop that. There's many barriers. We don't have the mainstream media. We don't have access. We have Paul. <laughs> and you too. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> But <laughs> mainly, mainly people will get to know, mainly people will get to know what socialists are really all about by what socialists do on the picket lines of Calibri, on any kind of picket line, in the struggle for gay marriage, in the struggle against the war. That's how people will get to know what socialism really is. Not, we're not going to have NBC and CBS giving it to them straight. They're not going to broadcast any of us talking about that. We're going to have to spread it like this and through the struggles that are out there today. If you are for that kind of a project and building that kind of a political party, wouldn't that be great? In this country, a socialist party, you should join us. Thank you. I was thinking about the whole thing of um, people changing ideas that are deeply ingrained. Um, one of the, and I just want to read you a little bit from this, one of the things that I think has been very, um, you know, like racism, the civil rights movement made it so that explicit open racism against African Americans is kind of like not acceptable. You have to do it other ways, and they do. Um, but, you know, that was like, that in and of itself was a big achievement, but it's still okay, or it's still, it has been okay in a lot of social circles and um, sometimes in the media to be very homophobic. Um, but you see now, I think, the, the, what, makes, what makes the difference? The struggle of black people made it so that people had to respect us. And you, like, you can't say that to black people in public or we're going to do stuff. We're going to march. We're, there's going to be trouble. And now gay people, have, standing up for themselves, I think are beginning to challenge working class ideas. Notice New York and California ain't got gay marriage. It's, you know, Iowa uh, and, <laughs> that want it, um, and not California. Um, and so I think we have to kind of challenge our ideas of, like, you know, who's open to what. That is changing in America. Who's open to what kinds of ideas uh, is something that's changing right now. And there's just a really great, I won't read you the whole thing, but there's a, a great example. You've heard some people talk here about the, in Chicago, the Republic windows and doors workers, fresh off of their victory, they actually made conscious solidarity with the LGBT uh, movement for gay marriage in Chicago. Went to a socialist meeting, sent representatives from their union to a socialist meeting on gay marriage and spoke to, the, I mean, they didn't have to do that. They spoke, uh, you know,
know, a worker came, uh, there was a few of them there, and then one of them got up to the mic and said, our victory is yours. Now we must join with you in your battle for rights and return the solidarity you showed us because the gay movement showed up on the Republic uh, picket lines. It's like you, <laughs> you can't argue with that. Um, and that's the kind of thing that um, I think helps to challenge some of the ideas we've been taught for a long time. The thing about the Ivy Leagues, and yeah, I went to an Ivy League school, I went to Brown. Um, I think that we, it's just very clear, you know, we have a, a class system of education in this country. And the ruling class goes out of its way to make sure that their children will receive the best education, will learn how to rule, will learn how to inherit the earth as it's set up right now. And that's the kind of institution that Brown University really is. It's the kind of institution Columbia University is. These are institutions of the ruling class. Um, and I think part of what you see, and that's part of what's been exposed here with all these people around Obama, Geithner and Summers and all these people, it's like they're just in and out of like Harvard and Goldman Sachs and then you know, they're in the Treasury and then they're back to Goldman Sachs. And even, you know, even as it came out that Summers was like making money while he was at Harvard. He like had this thing on the side with the hedge fund. It's like, and it's just no shame about it. But people are starting to figure out that those people are not just the smart ones. It's not just that they're more talented. See, they saved their money and you spent, you see. So, you know, that's why you're shit out of luck. And they're at heart. You know, no, it's because they're a class of people who set up stuff for each other. You know, it's like they set up these jobs and appointments and bounce back between them. They are a self-conscious class. And they go between these different institutions quite fluidly. Um, and I think that's something we actually have to patiently explain to people about Obama. And I say patiently explain because, you know, people are, are, I think, feeling something that's important. They've gotten something important about hope and the possibility of change, and they've learned something that's good from the whole Obama phenomenon. And so it's like if people are out there thinking, yes, we can, we don't want to be the people saying, no, you can't. Um, but people, I think, are going to, if you look, I mean, you know, uh, look at what Obama's doing. It's like, how do you explain that if you don't understand that he is now the leader of that class? While you're speaking, I was just thinking about, um, you know, it's just so true, um, the way that this, you know, it's an internet, it's a, and increasingly because of technology, it's a smaller world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to wait two months for something to come through on the wire about what's happening in another country. It's, uh, you know, it's on your uh, cell phone um, that second, um, to some people's annoyance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's a... That's absolutely very, very true. Um, I was just thinking about how, what happened in Puerto Rico recently where um, SEIU tried to take over what is a very radical uh, teachers' union and, and they were unsuccessful. The teachers' union in Puerto Rico um, has a lot of control of the shop floor, something that unions in this country gave up in the 70s um, in exchange for other, kind, you know, kind of was bargained away to our detriment. But that control of the shop floor of your working life when you show up on the job kind of thing they have held on to. And a number, there's been quite a bit of uh, communication between those teachers and uh, teachers in New York City. And because we're trying to organize around uh, defending public education, the cuts, all kinds of stuff you can imagine. I'm sure it's the same story everywhere. Um, but one of these guys just said, you know, they kind of were like, well, how'd you do it? How'd you have such a strong union? And the guy just said straight up, well, we started with a socialist organization. Uh, we built that up for many years. And then we went on to try to organize a union. So it doesn't even necessarily go the other way around. I was thinking like in, in auto, the Communist Party had branches in auto before they had a union. It's like you need a radical organization in this country to fight through even for just some of the like reforms that we need. We have to have a radical movement uh, to fight for those. And by the way, in terms of winning over the church. I hear what you're saying, but I don't know if it all is going to play out exactly the way that you're saying. I'm just thinking of like some historical examples. Like thinking about Otto and Detroit and the church, I mean, part of what Ford did was he had the, you know, the church leaders under his arm, the black church leaders, and they would filter through, you know, they would like uh, say who could come work at Ford. Like, so they would make sure that they were not, not radicals, you know, the people who were going to, like, just work hard and whatever. So the black church, and then in exchange, Ford would give the black churches all kinds of money. Well, you know, that's a very, that's like just the corruption of the church right there. And I'm sure with the right-wing churches and blah, 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 it's all that kind of stuff ad nauseum. But what broke it up? What changed it? 
Well, what changed it was the work that the Communist Party and the CIO did to challenge racism because in the prior generation, blacks had been used by, as strike breakers again and again and again, and the union was never going to go forward if they didn't take up the question of racism and organize black workers. And because they had done so at GM and at Chrysler in such a militant way, the black church leaders actually switched and started saying to people, you know what, you ought to join the union. And they just like, you know, they switched sides. And it was, you know, it was a, a different dynamic. And I guess what I'm saying is, if we're going to build up a socialist movement, it's got to be strong on the ground or it's not going to be strong. It's like nobody's going to hand it to us. Um, no charismatic, you know, speaker is just going to like get on TV and then overnight we're going to have a socialist movement. But I do think, like people in this room, if you're a socialist, you know, I'm not against us getting on TV and being charismatic. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, let's do it. But but that's not going to make it for us. You know what I mean? If it's not something real on the ground to people. Like I'm thinking about my coworkers. I'm, I, you know, my coworkers are not for socialism. Some of them are, you know, kind of are because of the economic crisis. We talk about it, whatever. But if, they, if Fox News gets on the TV and says, well, you know, socialists, they eat babies for breakfast and they worship Satan and uh, they're all left-handed. You know, it's like they, my coworkers are going to say that's not true. My coworkers would say that's not true. You know, that's not true for a second. Because Brian's not any of those things, you know, and we've worked with him for how many years? And they know that what I stood for, they know what I, what I fought for, and what I'd argued in the workplace. It's not just what you say, it's who you are. Who you are to people. And that's why we, as socialists, have to be <laughs> everywhere that we can be, but we have to be people who, again, see that the working class struggle is the source of our knowledge and understanding. We listen as well as speak.